Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the session on cases and tools for community organization for sustainable development as part of the Global Green Growth Week 2023. My name is Maurice Puyo. I'm a senior project associate in the Climate Action and Inclusive Development Unit of GGGI, and I will be your moderator for the session. To kickstart, we would like to share a welcoming video of our President and Chair, His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the seventh annual Global Green Growth Week. I speak to you today with a sense of urgency because our one and only planet is facing a crisis of unprecedented proportions. The theme for this year, fast tracking transformative climate action, underscores the grave and urgent situation. For many years, I have been emphasizing a simple truth about the climate crisis. There is no plan B because there is no planet B either. The opportunity to save the planet is not for the distant future. Now is the time. We need everyone to join and help tackle the climate crisis and the policies and solutions need to meet the urgency and severity with the boldness and innovativeness. The year 2023 was marked yet again with the record-breaking temperatures and severe weather events. To keep global temperatures below the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold and avoid the worst, we must act swiftly and boldly. Therefore, I'm proud that Global Green Growth Week brings together policymakers, thought leaders, investors, and innovators from the public and private sectors from all over the globe to discuss solutions to the climate crisis. And I'm also excited that there will be a special spotlight on young people and their pivotal role in a greener future. Much like the least developed countries and small island developing states, young people will be the most impacted despite having contributed to the problems the least. They therefore have every right to contribute to the solutions and their creativity and passion will be invaluable assets. With the conclusion of the first global stock take, discussions to operationalize loss and damage and other important issues, this year's COP28, which is just weeks away, will be critically important. And I hope the Global Green Growth Week will prove to be a helpful stepping stone to build the momentum, hone ideas, and much more. The challenges before us are immense, but so is our collective potential. Let us seize this moment and work together to fast track transformative climate action. Together, we can secure a safer, greener, and more sustainable world for ourselves and for generations to come. I wish you my best wishes for very productive discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ban. From local communities participating in development projects to cross-border communities of practice sharing knowledge, communities have been a vital part of sustainable development efforts. This session will present examples of developing communities for common purposes offline and online. In particular, the Green Growth Knowledge Partnerships tools and services for creating, connecting, and scaling communities will also be introduced in the context of knowledge sharing and project implementation. We have an amazing lineup of speakers 
today, as you can see, two of them are in person, and we have one colleague from Switch Asia program who will be joining us later online from Bangkok, Thailand. I will be introducing them one by one as we move along the agenda. Uh, before we continue, I would like to inform everyone that this session is being recorded and the recordings will be available on the event website after the event. If you have any questions, please share them through our Q&A channel on Zoom, and we will get to them later in the Q&A portion after all the presentations. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Inwoo Jong. He is a senior officer in GGGI and manages the GGGI Seoul office for GGKP. Prior to joining GGKP, he has worked on country implementation, reporting, and outreach at the Partnership for Action and Green Economy from UN Environment. Mr. Jong holds a dual degree in Master of Public Administration from Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs and Lo the London School of Economics and Political Science. In Wu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you very much, Marys, for that introduction. And um, thank you to the audience for joining today. I would like to present on um, an online community platform tool um, called the Green Forum. The Green Forum is a uh, online community online platform or uh, uh, of the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership, a partnership of more than a hundred uh, partners, including knowledge partners who are dedicated to advancing knowledge for policy, industry, and finance communities, um, and is also steered by the GGGI, OECD, uh, UNEP, UNIDO, and the World Bank Group. The Green Forum builds on existing knowledge platforms on the green policy, green industry, and green finance to provide a dedicated online community space for both um, individual experts as well as institutions and teams to collaborate. The Green Forum is also, uh, the Green Forum also has uh, features uh, called open discussions where individuals are free to discuss openly on different themes in green growth and sustainable development. And there are also a feature called groups, which allows uh, which allows collaboration uh, functionalities for community building and outreach as well. Currently online on the Green Forum, there are um, more than 20 open discussions uh, on various themes, uh, ranging from blue economies, um, carbon, uh, net, natural capital, and many others, with hundreds, sometimes hundreds of individuals engaged in discussions among each, in each of the themes. We also have, um, we also have uh, many groups where more than a thousand experts are currently uh, currently participating in the discussions. The Green Forum expects to have a, between 15,000 to 20,000 in the first five years of, of five years of its operation. And currently uh, we feature more than 5,500 members on the platform. Now, um, today I want to talk, um, my talk will be focusing on the group's functionality um, that can be customized, um, for example, on the access of flexibility of access. We currently have many groups um, of communities that are, uh, that, have, that are completely open, which means it's open to the public, um, flexible, uh, which means it's it, there are some rules to who can access and contribute to discussions, as well as private groups that are meant for um, meant for working groups 
and project groups for internal discussions. One of, one of the ways that um, the Green Forum platform and its group's functionality can be used um, has been demonstrated in a recent Stockholm Plus 50 related event where we had um, experts and institutions from many backgrounds uh, coming together to use the Green Forum group's functionality to create um, create discussions and share uh, documents related to the events, uh, leading to a successful preparation and delivery of the event. Another value proposition can be for uh, different initiatives as well as uh, projects to engage outside communities as well. For example, by having an open or a public group, um, the uh, projects or initiatives that typically have a community engagement components can invite uh, members of the public, their target groups, such as the youth or a series of experts to uh, register and participate in different discussions going on in the Green Forum and their uh, groups page, as well as to use this as, uh, use this as other stock taking, uh, stock taking of the public communities. Another use for initiatives and projects is to use this as a project archive that is more uh, that is more private um, in terms of access. Many projects or initiatives today are uh, have multi multiple stakeholders and partic participation from different organizations. And um, what may be uh, so existing solutions that may be okay for one particular organization may not always be okay for other members of the project team. To solve this problem, we have added additional functionalities um, to this to the groups, uh, including uh, including uh, 20, 24 hour backups and other industry grade uh, industry grade uh, security and privacy, and uh, and ability to create subgroups as and other uh, and and uh, and and other. Uh, uh, communication methods so that group moderators and the project team can receive uh, can receive updates as well as to contribute to the ongoing project in a more private way. Now the Green Forum is currently linked to the uh, rest of the GGKP uh, in the sense that uh, the GGKP offers a project web page functionality where the project, which may be perpetual or um, time uh, with a is time bound, can be shared through the GDKP uh, website and is connected to the knowledge management backend and its knowledge library. And the community platform, the Green Forum, and its groups are linked so that there can be there the resources that are generated or shared from the individual groups can be pushed to the GGKP library, uh, which receives uh, which receives a million or above views of, uh, page views per year. The GGKP also provides ability to build communities of, communities of practice that may not be linked to a particular project or initiative. For example, um, we have uh, we have experts who have gathered. On, on topic of sustainable trade, for example, as well as um, other topics, and in this case, uh, we have uh, we have more for in one of the groups more than one hundred individual experts that have signed up for a particular community of practice, and uh, and the entire list and the communications are moderated by the group moderator who has. Uh, access to functionalities that include group posts, uh, global postings, as well as uh, group digests, among others. Recently, the Green Forum has also added a uh, capacity building uh, feature to its uh, list of uh, functionalities. Uh, um, with an, an embedded service uh, that is used for courses and learning activities uh, and is quite often used for online online courses and classroom management. Um, and different uh, learning 
learning activities such as webinars or short courses can also be delivered to dedicated groups within the Green Forum. And this is a functionality that we are uh, currently building use cases for. Now, just to show uh, a demo of what our Green Forum groups page may look like, there are um, abilities to embed Twitter and other social media posts. So if the project initiative or the organizations have um, dedicated social media channels, they are able to embed this directly into um, the GDK, the Green Forum groups. There is also a stream as well and dedicated discussions that are similar to what you may see in, uh, for example, LinkedIn groups or other social media, as well as uh, as well as here linkages to uh, blogs and other knowledge resources that are part of the uh, global GDKP library. The moderators can facilitate uh, communications and sharing of information as well as ideas. Um, the design is meant to be responsive to different uh, use cases, for example, PC, mobile, and otherwise. Um, there are an increasing list of advanced group features, such as the ability to create um, subgroups or other dis uh, um, sub discussions for any task groups or um, any sub discussions. Uh, we also have uh, in our uh, latest editions ability to send global newsletters, group uh, based newsletters, uh, QA panels, um, and a dedicated set of tutorials that are meant for both moderators as well as. Um, new members. I would like to invite you uh, both as an expert working on uh, particular topics uh, in the area of green growth and sustainable development, as well as a prospective moderator or coordinator of uh, community engagement activities in projects, initiatives, or organizations to um, explore use of the Green Forum and its features. We are constantly um, adding new features and uh, please do feel free to sign up to the greenforum.org and um, explore what's already there, including discussions and, and group functionalities. Um, if, you, if you need any personalized demos or um, some handholding with how to use the website, um, both myself as well as the members of my team would be happy to uh, walk you through the process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Inwu. It's inspiring to see the community built on the platform and to see diverse experts from different fields and different parts of the globe working on a common goal to make the world a better place. Um, I hope after this session, more people will join the Green Forum. Um, you will already have seen how to join. So I hope you will have time to check the Green Forum website. Uh, now moving on to our second speaker. I am very pleased to introduce GGGI's very own Marshall Brown. Marshall is the program manager of the Iki Spark program in GGGI's carbon pricing unit. He has worked for GGGI for over nine years. Prior to his current role, he worked with the government of Vietnam on Article 6 policy approaches. Um, before joining the Vietnam team, Marshall spent four years in Jordan supporting the Ministry of Environment's Green Economy Unit and Climate Change Department and a broad range of national stakeholders to develop the Green Growth National Plan 2021 to 2025. He began his work at GGGI in program development and expansion, supporting the establishment of GGGI's programs in Senegal, Uganda, Nepal, Mozambique, Lao PDR, and Myanmar. Marshall, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so who is controlling the slides now? Okay, great. So yes, hello everyone in the room. Glad that you made it back from lunch and thank you very much Inu for inviting me to the session to to present about the the spark program so uh what i'm going to talk about today is the development of a community of practice that we have established through the program that i lead um 
So I think there are quite a few initiatives that are trying to exchange experiences uh, globally in the area of, of Article 6 and carbon markets. Um, and those, some of them have been going for a long time, uh, but ours is a new one that tries to take a little bit of a different approach. So yes, maybe the next slide, please. So before I go into uh, the actual topic uh, of the community, I want to explain a little bit about uh, carbon markets in Article 6. So uh, one thing that you might not know or might uh, uh, still be trying to put together about Article 6 is that it's based around this, this new um, structure of the Climate Change Convention after the Kyoto Protocol, which is under the Paris Agreement that all, all countries now have climate targets to meet. So in the past, uh, under the Kyoto Agreement, uh, only the Annex 1 countries were required to meet a cap um, uh, to, to, to reduce emissions under a certain cap. Um, and that allowed them to trade with non-Annex 1 parties uh, in order to, to offset any of their emissions. But in order to do that in the Paris Agreement period, there are quite a lot uh, new rules and procedures that are put in place to, to make sure that environmental integrity is being um, guaranteed in the market. And that requires a lot more capacity building for developing countries. So um, there, just a little bit about Article 6. There are actually three key clauses in when we say Article 6 that are relevant to, to the new climate, to the new uh, carbon market. Article 6.2 is um, deals with the topic of cooperative approaches, so bilateral cooperation between countries for the exchange of, of carbon credits. Article 6.4 is essentially a, a replacement of the clean development mechanism that is centrally managed by the UNFCCC Secretariat. Um, so similar concept that there, there's a facilitation of uh, carbon credit exchanges, but it happens centrally as opposed to 6.2, which is bilateral kind of bespoke trades. And then Article 6.8, um, it covers non-market approaches, but um, uh, this is not exactly quite clear what those are yet. So uh, next slide, please. So in order for countries to participate in Article 6 transactions, there is a, a quite a lot of preparatory work that is required. So what you see on the slide right now is that uh, the activity cycle that follows that arrow from screening and identifying projects or what we call mitigation activities um, to you know, developing concept nodes, uh, developing full design documents, having them validated, approved, um, authorizing those as a government, and then registering them, issuing credits, verifying the credits, uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, transferring the credits, tracking and reporting. So the majority of those steps that you're seeing on the screen were not the responsibility of developing countries during the Kyoto period. Um, it was pretty simple for them to sign a letter, letter of no objection or an authorization letter, and then kind of just let the project, you know, benefit from the investment that, that happened as a result of the project. But under the, the Paris Agreement, the developing countries have to basically set up their entire um, governance structures and institutional frameworks and strategies uh, and technical infrastructure in order to, to, uh, to transact according to the rules. So all of that to say, this is why the project that I'm that I'm leading exists. So next slide, please. It's called the Supporting Preparedness for Article Six Cooperation Project, or SPARC. We take the extra time to to put this slide in with the picture of a spark on it, so that uh, there's no confusion when you read the six there. It is a silent six. It's called SPARC. Next slide, please. Um, SPARC is a five-year uh, project that is funded through the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action uh, through a 20 million euro grant um, through the International Climate Initiative of the German government. SPARC is uh, implemented or, or led by GGGI, but we have consortium partners of Carbon Limits, UNEP Copenhagen Climate Center, 
um, the communal credit public consulting out of Austria and the GFA a consulting firm out of Germany. And they help us to implement a wide range of activities at the global scale, but also locally in our four partner countries, which are Colombia, Pakistan, Thailand, and Zambia. So the ultimate objective here is to help these four countries to be better prepared to, to uh, be involved in transactions, to benefit from carbon revenues that could that could increase investment in green growth and sustainable development projects. Um, and yes, and uh, maybe the next slide will we'll show a little bit more about that. So uh, what you see in the middle are the key areas of activities that take place in each of our three countries, uh, each of our four countries. So those include medium and long-term emissions planning activities such as uh, sectoral studies to update the NDC, governance framework development so that there are proper functioning institutional arrangements in place to authorize transactions, and then mitigation activity development, finding the projects, uh, et cetera. But you can imagine that there is a whole host of skills and expertise, and even as you're probably listening, all of the technical language that I'm using right now, probably seems like a little bit tough to understand and intimidating. Um, so you're not alone in that. That is pretty much the experience of uh, government stakeholders and even a lot of private sector, um, uh, finance sector stakeholders in developing countries. It's a difficult topic to understand, but it's required in order for them to transact, to, to know that. So uh, in yellow in this slide, what you see is this community of practice for Article 6 implementing countries. So what we try to do with this kind of cross-cutting set of activities is bring together government stakeholders, national level and subnational level, private sector actors, including investors, project developers, uh, and even the finance sector, the banking sectors, other experts uh, who are sector experts uh, in forestry or renewable energy or waste, and then academia, for, uh, actual professors from universities and students, so that we can increase their capacity around Article 6 and carbon markets um, in, in the Paris period. So how do we do that? Uh, next slide, please. Well, we establish essentially the community of practice. We use this concept of a community of practice, defined uh, maybe unofficially as a group of people who share a common concern, a set of problems, or an interest in a topic, and who come together to fulfill both individual and group goals. So uh, this is, the, when we talk about community for this session, this is our kind of concept uh, of community. Trying to bring together uh, experts, practitioners, uh, and anyone in the carbon market ecosystem who wants to try to solve this problem and understand it better. Uh, next slide, please. So the way we do that is through three distinct but interrelated areas of work. The first is sort of a functional um, work stream in our project that is the annual meeting where we bring the government stakeholders from each of the four countries together with all of the experts in our consortium. So across the, the program, we have, I think around 30 or more international experts in the area of Article 6. And we're very lucky to have some of the, the best known and most uh, well uh, uh, cited and uh, sought after experts in this area. We bring them together with the governments to kind of exchange experiences on an annual basis. And then at the uh, on the far right uh, portion of the slide, you see the national networks. So at the same time, we are setting up national knowledge networks with local universities and academics, um, providing them resources to convene once a year locally to discuss what their research interests are, ask any questions, um, and kind of provide um, an environment for them to uh, integrate carbon market questions and research topics into their areas of expertise. And then, Another important section um, of, this, of this work stream is the research mentorship program. This is where we bring students actually into the picture. 
So the, the main objective here is that um, master's level students will be invited from these four countries to uh, undertake original research in the area of carbon markets in Article 6. And then they will receive mentorship by the professors that are part of the local network. Uh, and then they'll be able to present that research at an international meeting um, with their peers in the network. Next slide, please. So, uh, so you can kind of visually see here what the, the community of practice looks like for now. Um, it's just in its initial phase. We've just issued a call for proposals. Um, but if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, we, we had our first annual meeting earlier this year in Bonn on the sidelines of the, uh, the, the SB meeting in Bonn with 48 participants, some really great exchanges between buyers and sellers actually, which is a very rare occurrence in the market. Although if you're interested in seeing that, I recommend you attend our event tomorrow, um, it will be very interesting. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and next one. Yeah, so uh, we've just kicked off the call for students to join the research mentorship program. We've issued um, calls for applications in those four countries uh, where students can send us a little bit about what their research topic would be, who their mentor is. Um, and we've done a number of road shows where we've actually gone out to the university students and explained what carbon markets are to see just so that they have some basic idea of what they would even be researching. Um, next. Yes, and the idea here is that they will not only um, produce a research project, but then at the end, they would be able to be sponsored, to have a sponsored internship paid for by the project um, that kind of offers them a career path to the area of, of carbon markets so that if they are interested in, in you know, participating, either working for a government or a private sector, they could potentially um, um, join in as practitioners. Next slide. So yes, our, our measures are basically to uh, create peer exchange, convene experts and academics, as well as the students, um, build capacity in, in the local stakeholders, and then offer them a career path. So all these different ways to get uh, the individuals engaged in this community of practice. So happy to, to take any questions if you have them. Thanks. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, among the highlights that struck me most was when you mentioned that you actually include the youth, the students in the discussion. It's amazing that um, you have this mentorship program, especially to the students in developing countries who might not have um, a lot of access to this um, opportunities. Um, now, uh, moving on, uh, before we proceed again, uh, we invite our audience to please share um, if you have any questions on our Q&A channel on Zoom. Uh, we will get to them later um, during the Q&A portion of the session after all the presentations. Okay, so last but definitely not the least, I'm happy to introduce our third and final speaker for today's session, Dr. Sarah Gabay communication and partnerships expert from the EU Switch Asia program. For over a decade, Sarah has worked in Thailand and the Asia Pacific region on communication for development initiatives. In her role as a strategic communication expert in the EU funded Switch Asia program, Sarah has played a pivotal role in shaping its communication visibility and outreach strategy. She has successfully built partnerships and fostered multi-stakeholder communication between various entities, including EU delegations, grant projects, government agencies across countries in the Asia Pacific, UN agencies, NGOs, and civil society. Uh, Sarah earned her PhD in Human Rights and Peace Studies from the Institute of Human Rights and Peace in Mahidol University, Thailand, and MSc in Gender, Media, and Culture from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a Bachelor of Arts in Communications with a minor in English Literature from John Cabot University, Italy. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Such a lengthy bio, so let's break the ice immediately. Can you hear me well and you see my presentation? Yes, we hear you and we can also see your presentation. Thank you. Very good. 
Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to, to join this session. As the only online participant, I have a bigger task to make my presentation a bit more engaging. <laughs> I wish I was there with you, but it was not possible at this time. So um, following today's session and uh, the spotlight that has been put on these communities, no matter how we define them in our context, I intend, intend to tackle the topic from the perspective of communications and also to share with you a little bit of practical experience and learnings from the Switch Asia program. Uh, one thing has to be said, a large majority of the world's population is really still struggling to understand sustainability and environmental issues, uh, along with the available solutions that are already at hand. And uh, people want a sustainable world. And this is also reflected by all the work that has been presented by my colleagues earlier. But uh, why are not enough people, um, organizations, individuals, and even government buying into sustainability on a much larger and wider scale? And these are, I think, some questions that uh, I'm sure uh, have been raised throughout all the Global Green Growth Week, and they will be raised in the next days. So words aren't matched with actions. Uh, I ask myself, what is the problem every day of my life? And maybe sometimes uh, I reflected, is communication and the ways we are sharing knowledge um, part of the problem? And uh, when I joined the, the Switch Asia program, um, this has been, these have been the most critical questions I've, I've really asked myself uh, uh, when, uh, you know, uh, strategizing for how to communicate better about sustainable consumption and production and all the related challenges. So before we jumped into the topic, in order to align everyone uh, uh, at, on the same page, I would like to, in a nutshell, explain uh, in two slides what is the Switch Asia program. The Switch Asia program is the European Union largest funded program promoting sustainable consumption and production, SDG 12, uh, in Asia Pacific. It was launched in 2007, and in, the, in 2023, this year, we entered the third phase. Uh, what happened in the third phase? As if we didn't have enough work, we expanded from 24 countries to 42 countries in Asia, the Middle East, and the Pacific. So you can see that, that the geo coverage is huge. Uh, and the main objective of our program is to, trans to support the transition of the region to a low carbon, resource efficient, and circular economy while promoting sustainable supply chains and products between Asia Pacific and Europe. So you see this continuous dialogue between Asia Pacific and Europe in all our program activities. We also work across many different sectors. Uh, uh, some of these I'm sure you are uh, also dealing in your community of practices. We work with key polluting industries in uh, the agri-food uh, sector, in textile and leather, in plastics, in sustainable tourism, in construction, in sustainable housing. As you can see, the scope of the program is immense. And without a good communications around it, no one will ever know what we're doing, actually. So the last slide about the Switch Asia that I want to uh, highlight is how are we functioning? The Switch Asia program is implemented by two components. One component is the grand scheme. And please, sneak peek at our social media, because in, on the 20th of October, we just launched our new call for proposals looking for innovative projects. So there are opportunities out there for practitioners like you to get more involved in the Switch Asia uh, family. So uh, the grants scheme basically has the mandate to support collaborative projects that are implemented by uh, a consortium of organizations, of partners, uh, between the EU and the Asia Pacific. Uh, what are the objectives of these projects? Uh, you can read the full application for grants uh, uh, on the EU main uh, channels, but in a nutshell, uh, we are looking at those uh, projects that are testing uh, and uh, are pushing the uptake of SCP practices, sustainable consumption and production practices in MSMEs and by consumers. So we tackle both the production aspect and the consumption aspect. And this is a particularly important component when it comes to those stakeholders that might be uh, very actively involved in initiatives like the two of ones, the two that you have presented earlier. At the same time, when we learn what's happening on the ground, we need to also inform 
policy. And therefore, uh, my team is called the policy support component. And what do we do? Basically, we try to translate those outcomes, those success stories from projects and feed them into policy dialogue through technical assistance and capacity building um, uh, initiatives that we try to uh, implement through the policy support component. Uh, so as you can see, work on the ground, champions already exist, but if those experiences are not translated effectively also into policy, we only have half of the mission accomplished. And therefore, in a nutshell, this is a very complicated functioning of the Switch Asia program. So let's go back to the main theme of this uh, session. Why sustainability communications? Why it is so important for the work that we're doing? For me, it's very important to make one thing clear. How we talk about environmental and sustainability issues will affect the way people grasp these problems, understand them, and come up with the solutions that we need. And for me, this is really what drives effective action. Understanding sustainability and the issues involved is crucial to the actions that will lead to transformative um, sustainable development. If no one understands what we're talking about, people will feel insecure, will not know where to go, and will just feel disoriented in uh, navigating uh, the very arduous path of sustainable development. So um, because sustainability has become really a major problem today, different communities, including governments, businesses, scientists, nonprofit organizations, and us as individuals, uh, are increasingly understanding that unless the message makes sustainability clear to all audiences, nothing is going to change. And this is a personal struggle that I also joined, as you know from my bio, my background is in human rights, media, communication. And then suddenly I was, uh, uh, you know, trans transported in the world of sustainability, environmental issues, and I understood that hey, there is a big challenge here. Why are people not understanding what we are doing, what we are saying? And, and why are they feeling that what we're doing is too far from their daily lives? So we have to really jump in uh, with different strategies to bring these issues closer to people's everyday lives. It's very important to reflect on definitions. Uh, I saw, for example, that Marshall defined what a community means for their projects. Um, this definition, I think, is very important, and I wish to share it with all of you. Sustainability communication is not about selling sustainable development goals or sustainability in a very competitive communication environment, just by increasing visibility, public presence. It's not an action of marketing, sustainability communication. Sustainability communication aims to resonate with different audiences, understand and consider their concerns, and recognize their values in seeking solutions for sustainability related problems. I think that we can connect this definition to what we conceive as community of practices uh, or different kinds of uh, uh, initiatives that are being spearheaded to find solutions to problems that are dominating in this world. So let's keep the de this definition in mind because you would be surprised how I would say 90% of communication experts in the world working in different sector do not even get the definitions right. Let's not even mention non-communication practitioners that are often being tasked with the great amount of communications work on their shoulders to lead initiatives, program projects, just like yours. And so it's very important, once again, to all align and have a common understanding of what sustainability communication is all about. So since 2019, when I joined the Switch Asia program, we understood that we had to come up with better strategies because the program, don't forget, was already initiated in 2007, but uh, they were doing amazing stuff and no one was aware about it. So we had to really fill in the gaps. And since 2019, we have come up with different communication strategies that I also welcome all of you to explore and experiment with. Uh, you don't need to do them all perfectly, but maybe you know the good starting point is to start. Communication for social change. It is important to showcase what change looks like on the ground when we talk about sustainability and this complex topic, 
uh, incur, in, uh, including, for example, carbon emissions, NDCs. These are all topics we work in the Switch Asia program, but unless we humanize these topics, no one will engage with them. So what are the existing alternatives that are championed on the ground? Who are the change maker advancing these innovations? It's very important to translate these complex, concept, complex con contents in practical, simple communication for social change uh, stories. Advocacy and communication is also very important. Targeting those policy makers and decision makers, making those stakeholders your allies in your communication. Again, once again, the work on the ground is essential, but if it's not informing the policy makers and the decision makers, uh, uh, the, the run on the path of sustainable development will be much more in, uh, uh, how do you say, like climbing a mountain. So let's look for those allies that can champion our messages and bring those key messages to um, a wider platform of stakeholders as well. Finally, the most difficult thing to do, change changing behavior. Behavior change communication strategies are very difficult to design and implement. Uh, with our program, we're we, we have been trying to target individual, the general public and community members. Therefore, as you can see, one of the segments uh, uh, of the Switch Asia communication strategies is reaching out to the population as our community of practice. This is very challenging. Mm -hmm. So no matter if you start with a community of 10 experts of 10 interested people in your topic or a community of 500,000 followers that we have on just our Facebook channel since less than three years, the struggles are the same. If you don't get communications right, your message will will not reach the right audiences at the right time. So let me share with you some of our, of our learnings that I hope will also help strengthen your initiatives. Uh, having an online presence and a good communication plan and strategy matters. And this is our learnings from talking to the many different uh, projects that Switch Asia has implemented on the ground and very different kinds of stakeholders that we are engaging daily. Um, it's very important to get communications right when we're talking about sustainability and environmental issues to establish authority and legitimacy uh, of your projects, programs, initiatives, no matter how big or small they are, at national and transnational levels and among stakeholders from multiple sectors. So authority and legitimacy is very important, even if you have the smallest of the projects. Strengthening your branding and identity. Um, no matter if you're leading a project, uh, an event, uh, or you're, you're, you're you know, wanting to promote the, or the work of your organization, it's very impo important to know how to boost visibility across media channels and platform. This is not just posting no matter what. It's about curating your contents to make them most mean meaningful for your target audiences. Strengthening credibility and reliability. This is very important. Audiences want to feel in trust in what uh, you're doing. So uh, this is particularly important when fundraising. Even if we work for some organizations that uh, are well off, <laughs> I think that all of us are always seeking and looking for some help because in this uh, uh, world in which we work of the nonprofit sector, uh, uh, we sometimes live off of fundraising, you know, depending on where we stand. So strengthening credibility and reliability through your communication strategy is of utmost importance to advance a particular action or cause. Last but not least from this column, building and strengthening communities of like-minded thinkers investing, invested in finding sustainability solutions and innovations. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's very important to create platforms and communities of practice, but if relationships are not being nourished and kept consistently, we will uh, not be able to uh, feed these platforms uh, uh, effectively. So using a very good communications plan can help you strengthen those communities and make them last longer. Tied to this content con concept, the need to build partnerships and networks to gain supporters to gain allies to deliver your services your knowledge and reaching targeted beneficiaries other organizations are more oriented towards advocacy towards activism and uh, digital media is very important nowadays uh, 
to express political opinions safely, because in our region it's also very controversial to communicate about these issues at stake. So we have to be very responsible in how we're communicating, but also to get those policymakers to pay more attention to global environmental and sustainability issues, influence policy and decisions, and really strengthening participatory actions. Digital media, social media are a tool that practitioners like us can really leverage to communicate better our causes. Um, finally, communicating experience is fundamental and telling those human interest stories that audiences can easily relate to and switching this discourse from apocalyptic and greenwashing statements to positive empowering narratives is really a must because I would challenge all of you to turn on your news channels at every point during the day and see which contents are being mainstream when we talk about sustainability. Are the greenwashing statements and the apocalyptic statements um, uh, more or less than the positive solution-oriented reporting and stories of change? This is a question I invite you to think about. So yes, creativity can indeed save the world. And I'm a big fan of this concept. But it is extremely hard because not everyone who is tasked to, um, you know, lead this very uh, ambitious program is a communication specialist. And sometimes our work is also the less fun funded in these um, programs. So understanding sustainability, it's also the challenges come from from many different points. One of the reasons is that sustainability is also context driven and it depends on how a local culture understand environmental issues and sustainability issues. So there cannot be a one size fits all approach to communicating and visualizing sustainability. Also, it's very important to respect cultural diversity, uh, recognizing local knowledge and wisdom, um, along with an intercultural understanding of people's values, lifestyles, behaviors. Uh, um, and this is some like something to think about, meaning that, for example, such a big program like ours, diversities and experiences that differ uh, even within, uh, not, not within a country itself, but also, you know, uh, within regions. So how do we target effectively uh, the 42 countries we're working uh, in? So you see how difficult and challenging it is to do communications properly. Um, from a global perspective, there are challenges that us scholars have agreed on, privilege. There, and, 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 uh, and I want to bring these points to attention to even strengthen even more the importance of activities like the ones uh, uh, presented by my colleagues early, uh, earlier. Privilege, there's a scarcity of different backgrounds and perspective in sustainability, leading oftentimes to one-sided communication that doesn't speak to diverse audiences and cultures. And today we spoke about local communities, communities of practices, but we would be astound, astonished that some of these uh, people might actually not care at all about some of the issues that we are trying to curate, uh, you know, night and day with the uh, sleepless uh, nights, trying to bring knowledge to um, particular individuals. And therefore it's very important to understand who our target audience is not to lose the message. Barriers. English is often the dominant language of sustainable development. And this we, we witnessed even today during this uh, conference where we come from very different countries and regions. And even in a region like ASEAN, um, in which we work, uh, English is the dominant language for mutual understanding. So you see how this already a priori excludes some of those uh, communities that might not master the language. And also very often technical jargon is used that is not understood by the general human being. <laughs> not thinking across boundaries. Sometimes uh, um, we have stakeholders and partners who are working in silo, uh, uh, you know, and uh, if we strengthen our hands, our efforts, we could uh, reach a much bigger um, butterfly effect in what we're doing. But also a very important uh, thing that I've seen when I joined the SCP community is that um, 
there are dividing lines between topics like economy and the environment, as if these two were completely not related and uh, disjoint, which is also uh, where the media fails to report about sustainability and environmental issues uh, um, effectively. In fact, talking to many journalists, uh, most of them uh, complained not having uh, enough knowledge to report uh, well about sustainable development. And this is a huge problem because, because the media are basically the direct link to our communities, to our individuals, to our populations. And if we don't invest on capacity building on how to report about these issues uh, to the media, uh, this will lead to invis greater invisibility uh, about our issues in mainstream media. And Switch Asia now is exploring opportunities to strengthen connection between uh, and building the capacities of media professionals in different regions and also, um, you know, the capacity of organizations that are working on these issues to communicate better with media professionals. So we can, the good news is that we can overcome some of these issues with very simple uh, uh, strategies. For example, complex jargon and technical terms. We have to all make a, a you know, a little bit more effort to keep it more simple, clear and accurate. This is a challenge that I always pose to the project managers I've worked with. How would you explain the same thing to your children or to your parents or to the elderly? If you manage to uh, break down these topics and for them to understand them, then you have succeeded in your communication mission. Also, it is very true that uh, um, communication, uh, you know, sustainability is an abstract and complex idea that is not always easy to explain. Uh, we need to really try to make it more specific and bring it closer to home. And we have to here use our creativity on how to make the uh, issues, for example, of sustainable consumption and production in this case, uh, relatable to the people. How can they take immediate actions, direct interventions? Because sometimes when I look at the news uh, or I speak to students, youths, they reply, and how can we contribute? The issues are so huge. Where can we start? Uh, you know, uh, and uh, if we manage to break it down more simply to the wider public, starting from very young age in schools, then I think that that's the right path for sustainable development to be more tangible and more achievable in our everyday lives. So make it easier to tell and make it easier for people to relate to. And I, for example, continuously see such images, even by, you would be surprised, organizations that are really doing amazing work on sustainable development and communicating about sustainability. But images like this need to stop, need to be banned, need to stop circulating because uh, uh, they have actually contributed to that big problem of bringing sustainability even further from our direct experience. Reducing Sorry to cut you off, Sarah. Can we wrap up in a minute? Thank yes. you. Reducing audience engagement. So reject those cliché and say it your way. Last but not least, this is my last slide. Communicating experience and using authentic facts in storytelling is very important. And what we have tried to do with the Switch Asia is really to show the human face of sustainable consumption and production. Before SCP was a concept that was very far from humans, <laughs> but actually who are the champions? The people behind their projects, the people who are working on the ground. So give it a human face and make it much more relatable. I will close here and take any kind of question that the audiences might have. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so I will stay connected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that very, I hope you can hear the claps you're receiving from the room. Um, for the very inspiring uh, presentation, the work you do in Switch Asia um, is truly inspiring and impressive. Indeed, we need to do more in terms of communicating what we do and, and tailoring our communication strategies according to the types of information consumers. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap our session. Uh, a big thank you again to our speakers, uh, Inwu, Marshall, and Sarah online. If you have any questions, uh, the presentations will be available online. I'm sure you can uh, reach 
out to our speakers through the PPTs. Um, and you can also email um, us uh, through our GGGI emails. Thank you once again for attending today's session and have a